Hello and good day. Uh, my name is Darian Sanchez Nicolas. I'm a PhD candidate in the Film and Movie and Image Studies uh, program at the Mel Holpenheim School of Cinema at Concordia University in Montreal. The title of my presentation for today is All Inclusive to Tanku Cinematic Voyages Between Cuba and Quebec. With this presentation, I strive to analyze specific instances in which transnational independent filmmaking becomes entangled with alternative forms of international tourism and local discrete economic investments. What follows is a survey of the involvement of domestic hospitality business in Cuba, Palabares, private restaurants located in family households, and Casas Particulares, bed and breakfast type hostels, as an official partners in transnational film productions between Quebec and Cuba namely in the films All You Can Eat Buddha by Ian Lagarde, 2017, Cuba Merci Gracias, Alex de Martin, 2018, and Sur les Toiles de Van, Pedro Ruiz, 2018. I consider that these films constitute therefore cinematic voyages, that is the marginal intuitive application of entrepreneurial tactics to foreign leisure and cultural travels, transcultural personal affective relations and domestic spaces and activities in Cuba towards the completion of independent transnational film projects. I am to position this cinematic voyages as a lot of different places to further explore dominant ideas about the complicitous destructive nature of the global tourism and media industries in the ensemble of South North relations in general but more particularly within the framework of social, economic, and cultural connections between Cuba and Quebec. In a more practical sense, I believe this case is worth attention, given that they open new paths of social and economic collaboration with private citizens and enterprises in Cuba, a much needed breath in the progressive liberalization of markets and investments in the island that do not directly strengthen or that outright circumvent the all-encompassing presence of the state in financial accumulation and wealth distribution. There are three main questions that I take as departure point to elaborate upon them. How can we think of transnational film and tourism practices along the South-North divide as agents of anti-colonial, anti-imperialist cultural and economic cooperation? What production strategies and representational tropes serve this purpose? And finally, Besides the ideological and discursive elaborations at play in this project, how can issues of race, nationality, gender, sexual identity, and class inescapably complicate the extent of such solidarity actions for both foreign and local agents? As a working project, I do not hope to come up with clear cut answers to these questions, but we act as a compass, though, to map out the applicability of Stephen C. Caden's notion of open quote dialectical critique, end quote those that grapples with both the cultural representations that perpetuate domination of some over others and the covert or explicit criticism at, of the center and its domination of the margins, end quote. This project draws primarily from film analysis, bibliographical research, ethnographic material, and interviews with industry professionals, freelance cultural workers in Quebec and Cuba, diplomatic officials stationed in the island, owners of Casas Particulares and Paladares in Cuba, as well as private tourists of Quebecois origin. The interviews sought to understand the concomitants of cultural, cinematic, and tourism practices, and the ethics and politics these interlocutors perceive and enacted while working and living in between Canada and Cuba. The literature around film or movie-induced tourism has grown exponentially since the end of the past century. The early concept of movie-induced tourism inaugurated the analysis of the reciprocal dynamics of film and place awareness resulting in mutually beneficial revenues for the cinema and the tourism industry. As Stu Beaton notices, notices, film is posited in this tradition, open quote, as a driver of social construction, destination marketing, community relations, business response to emerging opportunities, including film studio theme parks and tours on location, and filmic tourist motivation, end quote. Despite the heterogeneity of this list of potential domains of inquiries, either implicitly or explicitly, all of them relate film-induced tourism to reception, audiences, and fandom studies. On a different note, scholars Ward and Oregon 
proposed the relocation of the duality of film and tourism from the after image of movie release and reception to include production crews profiting from working holidays to a destination or to audiences attending forms of entertainment that include on-set spectators like Big Brother Australia. As both, both authors indicate, open quote, tourism management and planning were there responding to the film producer as a long stay business tourist and film production itself as another event to be managed or catered for, end quote. However, these forms of, open quote, tourism voyeurism are intimately tied to notions of superiority shaped by gender, class, education, race, culture, and geography, end quote, a sentence by Norris Nicholson. Despite being one of the most active tourism hubs of the Caribbean, there is much to be done to relocate the place of cultural industries in the tourism dynamics of Cuba, and particularly in its private sector's involvement in the trade beyond the survivalist transactions and struggles of everyday living. Now, in order to speak about Quebecois Cuban relationships, one must simultaneously explore the multiple ties between Cuba and Canada. The inclusion of Canada in this seemingly bilateral portrait comes from the acknowledgement that it is always already susceptible to the influence of external players, state and non-state related, acting at varying levels who have a stain in the sovereign decisions of Cuba and Quebec. By extension, one can argue that both the cinematic associations that are interested here and the ensemble of mutual interfaces between Cuba and Quebec are localized and predominantly private in scope, intra and internationally negotiated and affected when it comes to economic policies and globally imagined in its diplomatic and cultural aspects. These links are often dependent on the particular charisma of each Canadian administration too. Historically, they have rocked back and forth from the political, from what political scientist Robert Wright perceives as attitudes of constructive engagement of most liberal leaders to the benign neglect of conservatives and their alignment or lack thereof with Washington's muscle for foreign policy towards Cuba. Permanent migration between Cuba Quebec and Canada is very limited. According to the 2016 second census of Canada, over 17,000 Cuban nationals had arrived through various immigration programs. The vast majority still made their final residence in Ontario with Quebec following closely, according to Statistics Canada in 2017. Similarly, Canadians do not make up for a substantial portion of immigrants to Cuba. By 2019, only 18 Canadians arrived in Cuba with the intention to reside there. Now, large numbers of Canadians, especially Quebecois, go to Cuba on a yearly basis. The Oficina Nacional de Estadísticas e Información of the Republic of Cuba, the National Bureau of Statistics and Information, ONE, um, reported in March 2020, rising numbers of Canadian visitors up to over 1 million in 2019, out of a yearly total of more than 4 million. It is not an overstatement to say that more Canadians visit Cuba on a yearly basis than actual Cuban immigrants visit their homeland, according to an A again in 2020. Roughly 40% of these tourists are from Quebecois origin. In economic terms, Cuba constitutes Canada's second largest trading partner and market among nations in the Caribbean and Central America. According to the government of Canada, the total trade amounts to over a billion dollars every year, mainly in rubrics like agriculture, mining, and food industries. During the last years of the Obama administration and under the shadows of official figures, there are more discrete economic investments in the real estate sector and hospitality enterprises. I'm talking about ventures like Passion Aventure uh, by Daniel Soucy, uh, Jérôme Houdon's La Habana Vida, and La Puerta Rosa by Jean Fugère. These entrepreneurs were and are routinely portrayed by ICI Radio Canada as examples of Cuba's raw potential for yet untapped resources and infinite investments possibilities. However, as diplomat stations in the island have admitted to me, Federal and provincial governments are aware of these cases, but neither offer legal assistance or incentives for these enterprises. 
all of these non-state actors to become sort of paralegal agents on the ground in Cuba, employing local workforces and implementing grassroots alliances with other private enterprises in their environments. For example, Jean Fougère uh, confirmed to me that during the pandemic, he still kept subsidized in the salaries of his employees in Havana, despite not having clients due to closed borders. Since 2017, with the inauguration of the Bureau du Québec à la Havane, BQLH from here and now, uh, cultural collaboration has become a main indicator of soft power diplomacy between the two nations. Treaties like the Declaration, like the Declaration Commune de Coopération Québec Cuba, assures bilateral support to research, innovation, and science, sustainable development, cultural education, and instruction, just to name a few. This has magnified Quebec's presence in the cultural scene in Cuba, challenging France's place in the island as a historical promoter of Francophone culture in the island. In this sense, we can mention the establishment of the Muestra de Cine de Quebec in Cuba, Quebec Film Festival in Cuba, and Quebec and Canada being guest of honors of the 2020 International Documentary Film Festival, Santiago Alvarez in Memoriam, held in Santiago de Cuba as well, as the 2017 International Book Fair of Havana. Cinematic voyages are integral parts and reflections of the socioeconomic and cultural landscapes kept above. This film projects offshore their productions to Cuba from La Ville Provence, dovetailing precisely with larger interests like tourism, cultural policy treaties, and trade agreements. That being said, they have to perform all of the above in the legal financial and infrastructural void for foreign and independent media productions as it is the case in the island, while juggling at the same time their concerns for the ethical employment of local skilled workers and resources, and more often than not executing discrete gestures of care and solidarity towards the latter and, their provident and other providential allies. For example, our first object Ian Lagarde's All You Can Eat Buddha is essentially a twisted fable about international tourism, although it is also the ultimate product of our contemporary obsession with worldly mobility and transborder ambitions. This fiction film premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival in 2017 and went on to accumulate numerous nominations and awards locally and in the International Film Festival circuit. Its bizarre narrative places resorts and tourism kitsch at the center of the metaphor about surplus, consumption, the search for ultimate fulfillment and exhaustion as indicators of bourgeois upworldly aspirations. Mike, the main character, is a magnetic tourist visiting El Palacio, an all-inclusive hotel in an unmarked island in the Caribbean. He seems to be interested only by his constant visits to the all-you-can-eat buffet, that punctuate the episodes of the story. Mike's insatiable appetite make gravitate around him a universe of characters that are either fascinated, accomplices, or jealous of his cravings. Inspired by a vacation reading of Hermann Hesse's Siddhartha, 1922, Lagarde conveyed that his film meant for him an exploration of his spirituality through the extremes of capitalism, end quote. The production took place in Cuba in 2016. Proximity, easy access by plane, and expectations of low cost were all aspects considered by the director and the producer Gabriel to Gafachet as they both confirmed. But at the same time, Havana's notoriety as a greenfield location was highly valued as a result of the sheer number of American films and television productions that after decades were then allowed to go and film in the island. Fast and the Furious 8 by Gary Gray, 2017, Transformers, The Last Night, Michael Bay, 2017. The reboot of the TV series MacGyver and Netflix DOA were all shooting in Cuba following the fly-in, fly-out logic and disregard for local labor forces explained by Ward and Reagan. Lagarde and his crew tried by all means to break this cycle of exploitation and lack of engagement of these larger film projects. In association with Teresa Hernandez, a single mother of two, owner of the Casa Particular Casa Merced in Santa Havana municipality, they coordinated the work with their Cuban fixer Ernesto Leiva, appointed by the Cuban Institute of Cinematographic Arts and Industries, ICAI, which is Spanish. 
This logistics choice meant that they could potentially enact a different approach to both their personal tourism practices and the on location shooting process of their film. As they made of Teresa's house their headquarters, calculating idiosyncratic ethical preferences and economic constraints became the name of the game. The economy of the film production became entangled and dependent in no small part with the Casa Particular's economies and dynamics. The common spaces of the house were turned into meeting and planning spaces. The schedules of meals and housekeeping were in dialogue with the film and crew needs. Even Teresa's services and goods providers extended their assistance to Lagarde and his team to deduct costs. Given the peculiar capital restrictions in Cuba, where all transnational tran transactions are dealt with in cash to avoid US surveillance, the film producer could count on Teresa to waive four days the lodging expenses so that they could pay in time workers and other personnel to not max out their daily cash withdrawals. Teresa's enterprise was a de facto credit agency for the foreign film. Domestic economy, international tourism, and on location cinematic work are juggled together in this game of adaptation, creation, and persistence in the face of adversity and the unknown, all key aspects of play as a generative force as specified by philosopher Brian Smith. The production process is a pleasurable, ludic scenario infused constantly with managerial tactics of transnational film labor. Play and the ludic, as productive forms of adaptability, confer even a utopian dimension to this example. They bring about questions about self-identification for locally dispersed labor and subjects and invite the performance of alternative possibilities of identification and solidarity. Lagarde and Puget Frichet still today call Teresa their Cuban mom, not just a partner. They feel responsible for her even after years of the completion of the film and whenever possible help her by sending items and goods she needs for herself and her kids or constantly referring clients to their house. This was the case actually of Alex de Martin, director of Cuba Mercy. Cuba Merci Gracia. The film was also shot in Teresa's Casa Merci, thanks to a suggestion by Lagarde to Alex. The story about two female friends who travel to Cuba as casual tourists develops around their gradual distanciation with each other as they immerse themselves in the Cuban context. Not unlike All You Can Eat, Cuba Merci suspends ideas of star reliance based solely on capital access to embrace the complex networks of mutual aid around, around Teresa's house. It also positions in contrast the relative independence and mobility of the two Canadian women and the agency and power of the Cuban woman of color who turns housemaking and domestic knowledges into the source of her entrepreneurial success. In this case, the film project was not only implicated with the house dynamics, but with its place in its social networks. Friends of Teresa's kids made their, way, made their way into the screens. Neighboring restaurants and manicure parlors were also depicted. Cultural independent spaces where Teresa and her family are prominent were invited to appear too. The transborder film project became a community endeavor all by carefully following the below the line tourism activities of the director and two of his friends traveling and filming while in Cuba. As a final example, I want to bring attention to the documentary Sur les Tuas de Savane, 2018 by Pedro Ruiz. Ruiz, fourth documentary and the third shot in Cuba, Sur les Tuas center on the lodging crisis in Havana, following subjects that inhabit both physically and poetically the limits between the sky and the urban grid of the Cuban capital. A former drag queen, a poet and musician, son of the revolutionary figure Che Guevara, a prostitute and her husband, Rastafari, they have all occupied terraces and building rooftops as their living places. The original idea for this documentary came from the Jean Fugère, a Quebecois journalist retired in Cuba with his Afro-Cuban partner, with whom he runs a Casa Particular, also in a rooftop, rooftop in Centro Havana. From the queer space that is Fugere's La Puerta Rosa, the pink door, Ruiz sets up to unveil this microcosmos of characters that live in a perennial liminal state between what is Cuba and what it hides 
in its margin. Queerness here marks the illicit alliance between Fugere and his, part and his partner at transnational union and recognized by the Cuban laws, but also the use of the domestic lodging space as a production studio of sorts where planification, location selection, equipment administration and shooting were carefully designed and negotiated within the original mandate of the house. Queerness for me also signals the unusual pan Latin undertaking that makes Cuban alternative domesticities the epicenter of a cinematic dialogue bringing together Francophone Quebec, neglected portions of Cuban population, and the Peruvian Quebecois film director. As conclusions, we can advance that these examples of cinematic voyages constitute forms of imagining and analyzing the relationship between transnational filmmaking and tourism. First, they demonstrate Cuba's private hospitality sector's capacity for developing skills and adapting to the needs of foreign film crews needs, while establishing the lavish reliance on grassroots forms of cross-cultural cooperation and co-creation by employing local workforces and situated knowledges. We can argue that these films base their production on effective architectures that are coterminous with the everyday labor gestures of race, gender, and queer household work. Through, that, through radical arts of solidarity, cinematic voyages foreground transnational film projects and domestic enterprises that accentuate their mutual struggle for human scale empowerment and the reconfiguration of ethics and business culture when it comes to global mobility and media production markets. Thank you very much for your attention. Please direct any questions to the email in below in this slide. Thank you.